Why, good morning. Good morning, boss. Naomi, you're here twice. We have Naomi and Naomi. So, anyway, how you doing, Elon? I am doing pretty good. Yeah? A little bit too busy with them doctors, but uh, what can you do? Yeah, I know. This part of uh, growing older. So, I'm, so they uh, missing, I'm missing a lot of your uh, classes, mm -hmm. but uh, the only reason that I will miss a class is uh, them doctors. Okay. Well, you know, you got to take, take care of yourself. You know, that's... Yeah. Yeah. So... And I'm married, so if you don't want to take care of yourself, there is a police behind you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that is true. That is, that is very yeah. true. Yeah. I see Mr. Uh, Richard Johnson has joined us. How you doing, Richard? I'm still here. I, I see that. <laughs> Yes, I saw you there yesterday for a little while. Are you are you uh, are you recovering? I had the cancer wound mm -hmm. removed yesterday. Oh, okay. And now I'm re recovering. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now I've got. Uh, Another, another major surgery Tuesday of next week. Ooh, okay. Uh, well, I have to be there at the operating place at uh, three forty-five a.m. Ooh, wow! No. Doctor's in a hurry to get to the golf course in the morning, huh? Okay, <laughs> that's my report. Yeah. Um. At any rate. Yeah, well, I I hope all that goes well for you, you know. So, but yeah, I was just talking to Alon. You know, your your health, it's it's one of those things you really got to take care of. You know, regardless of what else is going on in life, that's number one priority. So, well, I got a wonderful wife, and she's very helpful. Yeah, that helps a lot. <laughs> having family and people to support you. So, you know, that's very, very important. All with the program. Well, you know, life is gonna keep going on. So, it just does that, so. I can stand up by myself now, but I have, I have to use a walker to get yeah. about. Well, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's enough about me. No, it's not, I mean. You know, we're we're all interested. We, you know, you're near and dear to all of our hearts. So, you know, you're a member of this group, and you know, we're all interested in what's going on with each other, and that everybody's doing well. So, and even if you're not, you know, it's it's like having having people you're connected to on the outside helps. You know, it's just support. More people pulling for you. So. So, you know, it's it's a nice thing to, to be there. Um, anyway, let's see. It's about time. We're going to get rocking and rolling here. And uh, we got quite a few things to look at today. Um, I was kind of hoping that, you know, like Lorraine and a couple of other folks would be here. Um, we've been talking a lot about a, uh, you know, drawing and, and about particularly drawing in pen and ink. And uh, I pulled some examples and I wanna look at those um, and we'll probably do that. I'm gonna wait a while and let people kind of get here. Uh, we also had a video that we had started uh, by an artist by the name of uh, uh, Kim, uh, she pronounces her name, you know, Kespier. 
Uh, anyway, we got about halfway through that and she got the underpainting, you know, in place. And uh, so now she was gonna actually at the stage where she's gonna start mixing uh, color and laying it up on the canvas. And so uh, I think we've got mm, roughly about 45 minutes. Uh, let's see what. Well, yeah, we got about an hour, hour left, you know, in this uh, video. And um, actually, it's probably less than that. It's probably like, you know, 35, 40 minutes, because after that, they do an interview with her. Um, and we'll probably cut it off and, and leave the interview part. And if you guys want to watch that, you can on your own. I'll send send the link out to you. Uh, but I, I want you to watch, you know, how she goes from this underpainting, uh, which, by the way, is still wet. Okay, it's it's basically a block in, and then she's moving into kind of an alla prima technique. Uh, so we're going to watch that. And then we're gonna come back and we're gonna look at some samples of like pen and ink drawings. And I'm actually gonna show you some of the stuff that I did, uh, you know, as, you know, when I was working as a commercial illustrator, because it's one of the, one of the techniques that I used quite a bit for both advertising editorial work. So I'm gonna share some of those with you as well, okay? So that's the plan. Anybody got any questions? It looks like your Wi-Fi name or password has changed. To update their Wi-Fi information, okay. go to the Alexa app. Yeah, Alexa's talking to me. Um, anybody got any questions or anything about what we're going to do? Hi. Okay. Hi, Wanda. We see the top of your Hi. head. <laughs> That's it. You know, nice hairline. There we go. We got eyebrows and eyes now. Yay! Okay. All right. Anyway, I'm going to start this video so we can kind of get through it and. Uh, and then we'll get back to talking about other things. All right. Uh, everybody see a uh, painting on an easel, right? Yes. Okay. Good. We got to the right place. All right. So away we go. You feel comfortable getting that big painting completed. And you feel like you have. Let me give her a little volume ready to just go to town on the big piece. Okay. Now, just, I'm going to just stop her for a second because this is a good time just to kind of review. If you look over to the left, right, uh, you'll see, you know, two, you know, two things. One, you'll see uh, what she would consider a color study. And the color study was actually a outdoor plein air painting that she did on site. And it's, it's fairly small. Uh, and then she went back in the studio and she broke it down into a, what, you know, you'd call a value study. And in the process of doing the value study, she made some slight uh, compositional changes to it. Uh, but they're very slight <laughs> and um, you know, like raising the street to break, you know, the, the line of the road, things like that. Um, so that visually it worked better. Um, and so then she went into doing uh, what we see to the right, which is the larger canvas and it's the underpainting. And she's just using like a transparent uh, red oxide, uh, you know, as, as the primary color, you know, for her underpainting and just, you know, building up the layers uh, and, and value, trying to get rid of, you know, basically all the white, you know, but set up a, a structure that's pretty similar, you know, to her, you know, value study over here to the left. Okay. So that's where we're at now. Let's let her go. want to keep this nice and loose. I need to know where the shapes are, but I also don't need any hard edges. 
I might darken the sky just a tiny bit too. There, that makes it more obvious where the cloud shape is going. So really close, just need to, some of the darks have, have um, have run a bit, just need to repaint a few of the darks. It's really important to keep this thin. Lots of mineral spirits because the mineral spirits will dry fast and that will allow you to get back into your painting quickly. You don't have to wait a long time to let it dry. So still keep this, even though this is a darker value, keep this very thin. little heavy handed on the road back here gonna thin that line out and then read then then I just then it disappeared toward the middle so I need to redraw it just so I have some idea of where that's coming in at I think that, that the underpainting is complete. Just make sure to cover the entire canvas. I have a few little white spots to cover. Okay, I'm just going to wipe out a few more spots on the cloud to get the to redraw the shape. Make sure it's a nice strong shape. Okay, I'm finished with the underpainting now. So um, ready to start getting some paint mixed. This is going to need a little drying time. So in between, I'm going to clean up my palette and then prepare to start mixing paint. And then we'll just let this dry for a few minutes and then it'll be ready to paint on. Okay, now that I have finished the underpainting, I am ready to start pre-mixing the paint. And this is one more piece of building the painting before you actually start, start painting on the canvas. Um, again, all of this takes some time on the front end, but it really helps make the painting process go faster. So if I have all of my paint pre-mixed, 
then I can really just go to town on the painting and not have to stop. It doesn't stop my flow of painting if I have to remix colors all the time. The other really good reason to premix your paint is you can see the color and temperature changes and the value changes from one pool of paint to the other. So I will mix all of my uh, sky colors together and all of my land colors together and then that way I can see how those temperatures and values relate to each other right on my palette before I even touch the canvas. So that's what I'm going to start doing now. I'm going to start by mixing the sky colors. So grab some white. And when you're pre-mixing paint, make sure you use a lot of paint. A lot of times in classes, I see students using just a little bit of paint. And then the problem is, is you have to remix your paint all the time. So I'm going to start by mixing the, the uh, blue for the sky. With the exception of the sky, most of my paint colors are going to have a variety of the three primaries so that you don't get. Okay, I'm gonna stop her for a second because I wanna point something out. Uh, actually, a couple of things. Uh, one, look at the table that she's working on. You know, what do you notice about it? Glass top. Yeah, it's- Yep, it's glass. Yeah. With the gray, gray uh, color background. Right. Yeah. So she's, she's mixing on this neutral color. And also look at the size of the table. You know, it's this really long table, you know, so she's got plenty of area to work with and it's all basically, you know, been converted to a palette. Right. Now I'm going to, I'm going to point out something she's doing that, you know, I just get like really irritated at. Okay. And, uh, you know, you see it all the time, but, uh, and you just kind of scratch your head and wonder, you know, these guys are professional artists. It's, it's like, haven't they learned better now, <laughs> you know, by this point? And uh, what did she do with that paint? You know, she got out some white and then she went to that cobalt blue. And what did she do with it? Anybody remember? Is she, 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 she. Yeah, yeah, but where did she you see she put it like right in the middle of that pile of white, right? Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and you know, my question is, why are you doing that? Okay, um, because the problem is, what would have happened if she would have gotten too much blue? Anybody? I mean, what's, what would stop her from adding some more white? Well, yeah, she could, but she'll go through that whole pile of white until oh. she's trying to get the right value, right? Right, right. Now she could, right. Yeah, now she could put a fair amount of white out there, but then when you take that other color you're adding into it, take it and set it next to it and pull it in a little at a time until you get the value, you know, the intensity, the temperature that you want. And you see that way you're not going to end up, you know, building these huge piles of paint, right? That, you know, you know, you ended up with, you know, so much more than you needed because you just kept overshooting, you know, or undershooting, you know, on, on trying to get your color and value. And so anytime you mix color, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a process, you know, you, you put your one, you know, basic color, you know, and then another, and then you, you know, pull them together, you know, in the center and begin to mix it and trying to get the right balance of it. Once you've got the right balance, then you can, you know, keep pulling it in, you know, until you get enough paint mixed. And then you basically lift it off the palette, you know, and, and place it, you know, somewhere off, you know, to the side out of your mixing area so that you can get to it and use it. But, you know, I, you know, I've seen students and professional artists both, you know, they want to mix 
a particular value or color and and they they go putting you know like the paint right in the middle of the pile and then it they get it too dark or or something's not quite right and then they have to go get the rest of it so it's it's you know this back and forth thing so a good habit is don't do that <laughs> okay think of just kind of organize it a little better real bright garish colors but natural colors the only time i don't use that rule most of the time I, when i don't use that rule it's it's in a, the blue of the sky because the blue of the sky is is really best just nice and pure so i'm using cobalt and white and i'll put a little ultramarine in there and then when you think you have the right value and the right color temperature, then hold it up to the color study, like so, and see if it matches. And that's my goal for this pre-mixing, is to make sure that these colors get close to the color study. Okay, now that I have the the blue of the sky going to start with paint uh, mixing the gray that warm gray for the cloud and I want to mix it right next to the blue of the sky if you look at the color study it is a little lighter than the blue sky but not by a lot so again a lot of white but this time because it's a gray, it's going to have some of each of the primaries in it. So I will start with some ultramarine blue, and a little red, and then a yellow, We'll start with the lemon yellow. I'm going to start with a cooler yellow. That's why I made that choice. I want it to remain um, a bit cooler. Hold that up to the color study. That looks too cool. So I'm going to add some yellow ochre in there. It's a warm gray, but I still want to make sure that it looks gray. So that's why I was coming at the color slowly, trying not to get it too warm too fast. But I do need to warm it up. Okay. Now with the yellow ochre in there, that looks really close. It looks like we need a little more red. And I'm gonna put a little more white in there too because I've gotten that value a little dark. Anytime you add titanium white to a color, it automatically cools it off because titanium white is a, is a cool white. So when I added that titanium white, I lightened the, the value, but I also cooled off the color. So I'm going to add a little more ochre. Usually <coughs> these nickel colors that are the, that take the longest to mix. That looks pretty close. Okay, the next color to mix would be the shadow for the clouds, that darker blue violet. And I'm gonna mix that next to these pools of color so I can see how they relate. 
I'm going to start with some ultramarine. Need some pad red light. I'm choosing the warmer red because that will already start helping that blue violet to gray. If I use alizarin and ultramarine, I just have two uh, cooler colors that will create a really bright violet. But if I use the cad red light, it will be a little grayer. Going to need a lot more, a lot more red and blue in this. And a little lemon yellow too to knock that color down, to gray it down a bit. Yeah, that helps gray it down. And that is getting really close. Um, my only concern with this is that I don't think I have enough paint mixed. So I'm going to add a little more blue and a little more red. I try to be really precise with these when I'm mixing because it just makes the it just makes the painting process go so much quicker when you feel confident about the color that you've mixed. This is getting really close. It might be a little dark. I'm going to hold it up to the to the canvas. Hold it up to the color study. It looks a little dark, so I'm going to add a little. <coughs> That looks really close. So there's the, the shadow color for the sky. And one more color that I'm going to mix for the sky is the red violet in the clouds, the lower part of the clouds, these clouds that are closer to the horizon line on the color study. Those need to be a red violet. So pull a lot of there it's a light value so pull a lot of titanium white out and start with cad red light and some cobalt see where that takes us it's probably a little bit lighter than, um, than it needs to be. What I need to do is compare the red violet with the warm gray because these two values are very close in the color study. They are different in temperature, but they are the same in value. So I want to look at the warm gray and compare it to the red violet. And it looks to me like this is a little lighter than it needs to be. So, a little more blue to darken it, a little more red, and then I also need to tone that back just a bit, so I'm going to pull some yellow ochre into it. All three primaries. Let's see what that looks like next to the next to the color study. It's really close. It looks like it could get just a little redder. And the cadmiums are really strong uh, paints. They they have a high tinting strength, so you want to be careful about 
how much you use. If you grab a large quantity of cad lemon or cad red, um, it will tint your paint really quickly. So that's why I always grab just a little bit at a time. I think we're about there. That looks good. There's one more color in the sky that I should mix, and that's the this uh, blue green, this really light value right at the horizon line. I should mix that before moving forward. Um, I don't mix every single color that I see on the color study all these little temperature shifts will happen later. I try to mix the average color that I see within each shape. So that little piece of horizon line is an important part of the composition, so I need to mix it. Start with white and cobalt. and put a little viridian green in there. Get the wrong thing, sorry. And that might need just a tiny bit of yellow. Don't wanna to get too much. Hold it up to the color study. That looks too cool still. I'm going to put some transparent orange in there. Transparent orange is one of those colors that will warm up a sky really quick, quickly. I used to have cadmium orange on my palette, and it's a cold orange. The transparent orange is a really earthy, warm orange, and I like it so much better because it doesn't doesn't create uh, cool mixes, it creates a warm mix. I think that's pretty close. So there are all my sky colors and they're all mixed next to each other. The next step is to start mixing the land colors. So I'll wipe off my palette knife and get started with those. I'll mix those over here on the right side of the palette. And I'm going to start with the, um, the, the horizon, that back hill that's really blue. I'm going to start it by actually grabbing some of the, some of the shadow color of the sky because that's what it's closest to. And I'll start that way. Add a little cobalt to brighten up this color a bit. Lighten it up also. a little more of that gray back into it. Let's see, I don't need a lot of this color. Let's see how that looks next to the color study. That is pretty close. From this point on, I need to mix the darker values in the land. I'm going to mix the shadow colors of the hill and then the darks of the trees, looking for that average value and that average color temperature within each of those shapes. So I know that this, this shadow is lighter than the mid middle uh, ground plane shadow and also lighter than the front shadow. So I need to uh, progressively get these darker colors um, darker values.
Let's start with some ultramarine blue and a little red. I know I'm going to need more paint than this. Pull some more blue in there. And a little yellow ochre. And now I've got to get it the right value. So add some titanium white. And that is two blue. I'm gonna add a little cad deep, which is a much warmer uh, yellow. To help warm up this cool blue color. And I'm, I'm looking at this color and comparing it to the back hill color and it looks like it's not quite dark enough but I'm going to hold it up there to the color study to see if, if it does need to be darkened um, maybe a little bit time to pull some more ultramarine back out on the palette This ultramarine blue has red in it, and that's one reason why I use it to mix the, the shadow colors for the land because the because that's already adding some some reds. So then we have our reds and yellows and blues. It's not as intense as cobalt. Cobalt blue is a very intense blue. And most of the time I use cobalt blue just for the sky. That is really close. So I'm going to stop with that color and move on to the darker value of the, I'm looking at the underside of the trees for this next value. Again, I will start with ultramarine blue. And I'm mixing this color next to that mid value that I just mixed. Now, it's important to note that this value um, on these trees is dark, but you still need to be able to see into it. And it's not going to be the darkest dark. The darkest dark is going to be right in the front for some dark accents right by the road. So once I mix these darks together, all these dark colors, this ultramarine and the cad red and the yellow, and I'm using yellow ochre again. Now I have a really dark color. So I need to add a little white so that I can see into that color. And once I add that white, do you see how that cooled, it really cooled the color up? Because the white is a cold white. So that cooled that off, I need to add something warm back into it. <clears throat> Probably some transparent orange. that will help warm it and that also helps gray that color back a little bit. And I'll pull that dark uh, shadow color for the trees up here to the color study to, to test it. And it looks pretty close. So now I have um, now I have the three darker values for the land, 
and it's time to mix the, the ground plane, the uh, highlights in here and this shadow area in the middle, and then this front area that's really in light. I'm gonna start with that shadow area in the middle because it is very similar in value to the, <clears throat> to the uh, hill that's behind it. So I'm going to mix it next to this middle value. Pull a little bit of that middle value over to get started. And there is a, a lot of blue in that shadow. So I'll use cobalt. And some ochre. And some red. Get all three primaries in. Now that red really warmed it up pretty quickly. I'm going to pull some cad lemon in that so it doesn't look too red. And that, if you compare this color, this um, middle, this ground plane color to the hill color, this looks too dark. So white. That really, that really cooled that color off. So now I will need to pull some more blues and greens back into it and then warm it back up. I want these two values to be very close together but still be able to see the difference. That might be close. We'll put that, test this color up here on the color study. That is pretty close. So I'll leave that uh, mid-tone green as is and not, now I'm gonna use that as a reference and <clears throat> get that lighter green in the back mixed. Start with titanium white. And add some green and some, some viridian green and some cobalt. And then pull some yellow into it. And we need more red to tone it back. So when you're mixing your color for greens in particular, the greens that are closer, that are in the foreground, have a lot of yellow in them. And then yellow knocks out first. So you'll have less yellow in the middle ground, and then you won't have very much yellow at all in the background. So if I want this color to appear like a distant green, first I have to get kind of a neutral green going. And then I can tone it back with red. And red is the modifier. Red will gray my, my green back. Create that gray green that I need in the distance. It seems pretty light still. Test it. Yes, it's, it's too cool and it's too light. So we'll warm it up with some red. 
and a little ochre. Get a little more viridian in there. Maybe even some permanent green. This permanent green is a very intense green. Um, and I like to try to mix my greens first using other colors. And then I will, if I need to punch a color up, I will use the permanent green. See that warmed up that, that green really quickly. So this could be close. It's a lot warmer. It probably needs a little more green to it. Again, it's these grayer colors that usually take the longest to mix, but they are very important. You need to get them accurate. Okay, there, I think I've got a color that's close to what I need. So now I'm going to mix the, um, a couple of brighter greens for the foreground. And it's gonna be helpful to see this yellow green next to that gray green. They're about the same value. The background and the foreground are about the same value, but the intensity of the color is quite a bit different. A lot more yellow in that foreground. So I'm gonna start with the Cad Yellow Deep and white and a little permanent green. We'll get bright right away. And a little ochre, so that way I have an earthy yellow in there. That green is definitely bright. It's probably a little bit too bright. I'm going to use transparent orange to, to tone that back a bit and to warm it up. And the transparent colors, it usually takes a little bit more of them to mix. So the cadmium colors, it doesn't take much to change a color with the cadmiums because they have a high tinting strength, but the transparent colors have a very low tinting strength. So this transparent orange doesn't tint quite as quickly. Now, I don't think I have enough paint mixed. I think I'm going to need to add to this. That's a pretty bright green. It's maybe a little bit too light. Put a little cobalt in there. And then go back to the transparent orange to warm up that color. So the cobalt is in there to darken the value. And the transparent orange is in there to warm it up. That is pretty close. I will use that as the green in the foreground. Okay, so I have the bright green for the foreground, and now I'm going to mix. Um, that yellow green, that almost, almost, it's almost ochre for the foreground that's next to the, the bright green. And I need to pull some more cobalt out. It's always the blues and the whites that I use a lot of. We'll just go ahead and pull some ultramarine out also and some white because I know I'll need it. Okay, 
mix this yellow up. So this color, these two colors in the ground plane on the, in the foreground, this green and this yellow, they are pretty much the same value, but they are different color temperatures. So I need to look at the green that I've mixed and compare this to that green, warm this color up quite a bit. And I, honestly, I think I need to cool the other green back just a little. So I'm going to put some cobalt in that. Go back to that green and add cobalt. There, now it is a little cooler. Now I'll get this green a little warmer. That way there's a noticeable difference in color temperature. It's getting close, it just is a little light. Get to pull more transparent orange in there. That nice warm orange. That's really close. Um, this is probably too bright. I'm going to hold it up to the to the foreground to test it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it looks like it needs to have a little more red in it to tone it back. So since it's green, again, that, that red will help modify the green. It'll tone that green back. A little bit more red and a little more green in there. because I want this to be a warm green, but I don't want it to be really, really bright. Still needs to have a little earthiness to it. I'm gonna pull some burnt sienna in there. Good choice. That's getting closer. Still needs some more red. a little white because it might be getting a little dark. I think I'm really close now. Yeah, that is good. So you can see that those two colors are similar in value, but they definitely have a temperature shift. They are different in temperature. So they'll play really nice together in the foreground. Um, the one other color, maybe two other colors that I need to mix are for the road and then also at least one green for the trees. So I think I'll mix that green for the trees first because I can put it right next to the dark, uh, the shadow color for the trees. Okay, so this green will be a slightly lighter value than the shadow color, than this cooler uh, blue shadow color, but not a lot different. I want those two, these two values should be really close to each other, just like in the color study. These two values, the greens and the blues, they're really close so that that shape still holds together. So within each shape, you want to adjust your temperature, your color temperature, more than your value. You can adjust value a little bit from shape to shape, within the shape, but you really want to adjust the, the temperatures more so. So this is a uh, green that's just a little bit lighter than the blue and it's a cool green 
needs to be warmed up just a little bit. Pull some transparent orange and some red in there. So I don't want it to be a garish green. It's gonna to have to have some red. That helps modify the green. That is pretty close. I'm gonna hold it up to the color study and test it. See if it looks like that green that I... It's, it might be a little dark. I think I'll lighten it just a tiny bit. A little, just a little bit of titanium white. A little is gonna go a long ways in this case. So that lightened the color and it also cooled it off. But in this case, I think that's what I want. So I'll probably leave it. it. Looks like it'll work. So the last color to mix is the road, which is, there's gonna be a variety of color in the road also, but that main uh, color, I wanna look at the average of the mass. And I see a, a warm, almost a, uh, almost a gold ochre in that road. So I'm gonna start with titanium white and ochre. And then add some red. Now this is a really light color. And it needs to relate to the, the foreground because that's where the road is, is next to these brighter greens that are in the foreground. So these three colors have to relate to each other. Hold this up. I, this color is probably close in value, but it's a little bright. It's going to need to be toned down just a little bit. All it has in it right now is yellow, yellow ochre, and red, the cad red light. So it has no blue in it. It needs a little blue that will help knock the color down. So I'm gonna put a little cobalt blue in there. Let's check this color against the color study. That looks good. So I now have quite a few colors mixed. I have my area for the sky colors and I have this uh, right side for the land colors. And if you notice, I, I mix them so that they can relate to each other. The, the shadow colors of the land need to relate, so I mix them next to each other, and then the green I mix next to the shadow, and, and then these, these, uh, this, middle ground, this middle ground colors I mix to each other, next to each other, and then I mix these lighter colors next to each other. That way I can see how the temperatures relate, and I can see how the values relate. So um, I think we're, we're, I'm done mixing the paint, and now the next step is we're going to create a block in for the painting. Okay, I have pre-mixed all most of the colors that I need. Um, the colors that I have pre-mixed are the, the main colors for each shape. Um, within each shape, I have averaged the mass in temperature and in value. And then that's the, those are the colors that are on the palette right now. So the next step is to block the painting in. And to do this, it's pretty simple, You're just using a, a large brush. So I'll get my number 10 brushes out and fill the canvas with the paints that I have pre-mixed. Um, get started doing that. And I will also use a little uh, solvent-free gel 
within the paint if it feels like the paint isn't moving quite like I want it to. So at least to get started, because I want this paint, I want to build this, this painting, uh, build it slowly. So I want the paint to be thinner in the beginning and then progressively get thicker. So we'll keep this paint thin using some solvent-free gel. I'm gonna start with the sky. In this particular case, this painting is more sky than land. So I'm gonna start with the sky because the sky informs us what's happening with, with the land. Really just trying to fill fill the canvas and I'm looking at my color study to, to go by uh, what colors to put where and, and what shapes and, and then and also the mark making that's an important part of this. You'll notice I'm using a, a vertical stroke to fill it in and that's because I want the back the sky part of the this uh, um, the blue sky part of the sky, not the cloud part, to be flat, to seem somewhat flat. So I'm using vertical marks to keep that flat. And then when I paint the clouds up to the sky, I'll use a different stroke for the clouds. And then that way there'll be some variation. And I'm, I don't get too particular right now about filling every, every little piece of the canvas. I like to see that underpainting poke through. If your paint gets a little too thick to work quickly, just add a little solvent-free gel in there. So I, I'm paying attention to where the shapes are going, but I'm not really paying too much attention to uh, being precise about where I start and stop the paint. The paint can go over the line of the clouds and that's okay because I want to keep this loose. And I'll even put some of that sky color in here in the cloud just to redraw the shape. Okay, clean the brush. I tend to use the same brush for the entire sky and then the same brush for the entire land. It um, need to clean the brush in between, but not doesn't need to be too clean in between that way. I'm going to work the the, uh, the shadow part of the sky now. These shadows should connect with each other, and they need to connect. Uh, really show us where the um, where the line of the, where the shape of the cloud is going. Right off the bat, it looks like that color is just a little too dark. But that's not a problem. I'm just going to add some sky color to that color, to the shadow color. Lighten it up just a little bit. Add a little cobalt to brighten it up a bit too. And these adjustments, just keep keeping your painting really organic. You know, being, being willing to make some changes where you need, need them to happen. 
If you pre-mix the colors though, that, that slight adjustment will go much quicker. There, that's lighter and just a little bit, a little less ominous, ominous there, a little bit, a um, little bit lighter. Get those shapes right. This, this part of the clouds are also painted with the mass, painted, and what I mean by that is this shape is a longer rectangular shape. So if I was gonna paint across that mass, I would paint horizontally. But since I wanna paint with the mass to keep that flat, I'm gonna paint at the diagonal that the shape, where the shape is. So painting down, painting in a vertical motion, is painting with the mass. Because keeping those dark colors flat will allow those lighter colors later to, that I build on top of the, the darker colors to, to pop, to help pop. Um, and you'll have a variety of textures that way, a variety of brushwork. Be careful about where I end the horizon line. Got to get this nice angular shape in here. That really helps move our eye. This paint is getting a little thick again, so add some solvent-free gel. Okay, and there are some shadows in the clouds that are in the upper left and upper right, and I want to include those. I just don't want them to be quite as strong as, as these shadows. So we'll just put a suggestion of those shadows in. And you'll notice that most of the time I am looking at my color study, and then sometimes I'm also looking at my value study to make sure that the values haven't changed. But not very much am I looking at my photo reference. My photo reference is there if I decide later on that I need to add some some detail to the painting, but I really want to focus on the big shapes right now. Clean that brush. I'm going to start massing in the, the clouds next. Some more solvent-free gel to throw in there in the warm gray to keep this paint thin, thin to thick. So we start out thin with the paint and then make it thicker as, as I layer. And for these clouds in the upper left and right, they are not as important as the clouds here in the middle 
of the painting. So I could throw a little blue into that warm gray just to darken that color, make it a little different from the rest of the clouds, and that'll help knock that color down a bit. you don't want the viewer's eye to look at your the corners of your painting you want the viewer's eye to look uh, at the focal point of your painting Also, it's really important to hold the brush by the end of the brush. That way you, you stay loose. Okay, I'm gonna clean this brush and get the warmer gray in. in that paint. Add just a little yellow to that warm gray. Warm up this part of the cloud just a little more. That looks nice. There, that's what I needed. Now I want to use a variety of uh, brushwork. I'm painting, this is a longer shape, so if I was painting this shape with the mass, I would paint across it, kind of at a diagonal like this, but that flattens out the shape. So I want to make sure that I find a variety of mark making and paint across the mass. And this block in, it's, it's going to look very flat at first because it's all one color in one area. But later on, I'll break that up. This just really helps keep your shapes simple, simple and strong. I'm gonna start adding the, the uh, redder, the red-violet color of the clouds. Put a little gel in that paint to keep it thin.
just going to um, lightly touch this to drag that paint across. The touch that you use with your brush is also really important. I can push this paint down and it will make a very strong shape, or I can barely touch the canvas with my brush and it will soften the shape. Hey, would you like to win a beautiful painting worth almost $3,000? We've got a beautiful Joe McGurl plein air study that he's done of the sunset in Maine. It's gorgeous. If you want to have an opportunity to win it, go to paintinggiveaway.com. Just put in your email. That's all you've got to do, and you only need to enter once. We'll be giving away the prize at the end of May. Go to paintinggiveaway.com. Okay. I think that's kind of the end of, uh, you know, her presentation. Uh, let me check. Let's see. Well, yeah, they kind of go into the interview, and we can kind of pass that by. You have to pay for the rest of it. Yeah. Yeah, but you get the idea. Um, and the thing I want to point out, you know, uh, if you hadn't noticed, was that... Uh, while she was laying that paint in there, you know, she wasn't trying to fill up, you know, every, uh, every square centimeter of that canvas and cover over the underpainting. Uh, she was actually, you know, letting it stay open. And that's really kind of important because a, a lot of people, you know, when they take the time to do an underpainting, uh, they bury it. <laughs> You know, and you, you will, you'll lose a lot of it in the end. But, you know, creating what we call those open or broken paint passages end up, you know, really kind of enriching the color and the texture and the, and the surface of the paint. And they really make a painting interesting to look at, um, you know, rather than having everything, you know, just kind of like paint by number, you know, kind of big, you know, blocks of, of flat color. So, uh, you know, there, there's a lot about her art work that I really like, um, you know, as far as color composition, you know, things like that. Um, you know, everybody does things differently and, and there's things that, you know, I, I don't necessarily, you know, kind of agree with, you know, with her. Um, one thing is, you know, the way she talks about and describes color, for example, is, is a bit confusing. Um, you know, as far as, you know, color temperature and intensity, but, you know, every, everybody's kind of got their own ideas about that. Um, but, you know, a good painter, you know, very good painter, um, you know, does some really, really strong uh, work you know, when you look at the body of work from her. And, uh, you know, she, you know, she'd be really well worth looking at and, and taking note of how she approaches, uh, you know, doing a painting. Uh, one thing I wanted to, to kind of highlight too, and she talked about it a little bit, and it's, you know, kind of why you go through this process, you know, why would you do like a plein air color study and then come back in and do a value, you know, breakdown or study, and then kind of work with the composition, tweak it a little bit, and then go into a large scale painting and not rely on your photo reference, right? And the reason for that is that, you know, your goal isn't necessarily to reproduce the photo, you know, it's to create a piece of art. And you've made a lot of decisions and observations and things in that color study that in many ways are a lot more valid than, you know, looking at that photo. Um, now, the exception to that might be like in portraiture, 
you know, where you're trying to be more accurate about proportions and things like that, you might want to rely more on that photo reference um, if you don't have the ability to work from life, you know, with, with the actual person. But, uh, you know, in landscape painting, you know, if, you, if you're working in the studio, you know, it's really important, you know, to go actually out, you know, to a location, you know, uh, look at those colors, you know, look at the degree of contrast and the time of day that you're painting, things like that. You know, get that into, you know, that initial little plein air painting. And many of these plein air paintings are not big. You know, I mean, they're, I, I tend to actually work kind of on the large size of uh, plein air painting. So I, you know, I'll do like nine by 12s, one by 14s, um, you know, occasionally eight by 10s, which are not real large. But a lot of these painters, when they go out and paint, you know, they're working, you know, six by eight, you know, five by seven, you know, I mean, they're working small. And the reason they're doing that is, you know, A, they're trying to stay very loose and not get caught up in detail, but they're also trying to move very quickly because they have a very limited amount of time, you know, to actually capture that scene. So if you're trying to do a bigger canvas, it's going to take longer to just physically cover it with paint. And, uh, you know, so a lot of these things are almost like little small abstract paintings. Um, and the, the more you look at plein air painters, um, you know, the more you'll see that, you know, a lot of these paintings are really, really, you know, not very big at all. Uh, so, you know, the idea is go out, make some good observations, you know, put down some good, accurate color contrast, you know, and, and play with the composition and then go back, you know, to a studio where you have a more controlled environment and then you can do a more developed painting. So, and the same thing is true if you're doing um, kind of like figurative painting and you're working from life and you're going to some of these, um, you know, figure drawing groups, things like that. You know, chances of getting a finished piece of work, you know, out of a two to three hour session with a model, probably not gonna happen. So, you know, you really just kind of want to work, you know, at a, a relatively small size, you know, and, and again, focus on, you know, trying to get good composition and good color and, and, and good value uh, out of, you know, that session. And then if you have the luxury, you know, of maybe getting some photo reference or something of the model, if you want to come back and do a more finished painting, okay, you know, you can do that. But, uh, you know, your, your goals are going to be different in each situation. Yeah. Anybody got anything that they want? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe this is a teaching video or paint along video, but I noticed uh, on her plain air that she had the, all of those colors and I'm pretty sure she all day out there mixing them up so what was the difference in that why why would she not use the same technique she used in the plain air to pr reproduce those colors on a on a, a larger scale yeah well the the fact is you know when she was doing a plain air she probably didn't sit there and pre-mix the color because you didn't have time so she was mixing as she went and again if you look at the the little study that she did um, that really wasn't very big, you know, again, it was, I think she said it was like six or eight inches, you know, and so, um, you know, you take that and her normal process is, you know, she'll do that small plein air and then she'll do a much, much bigger canvas, you know, for this particular demonstration, she kind of went to a medium size. I think she said it was like 16 or 18 by 18. It was kind of a square format. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but, you know, you don't, yeah, you don't go out and pre-mix a lot of colors when you're outside. You know, you just, you don't have the time to do that. Your- It seemed like she was- hmm? It just seemed like she was- excessive amount of time to uh, mix the colors. Maybe that was, she was just teaching us. Maybe that's what she was doing. Yeah. Well, I mean, when she's back in the studio, 
Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason she took all the time to mix the color, uh, which is not an unusual process for some people. I mean, like Dan Green, you know, spends probably two to three hours a day, you know, s just mixing his portrait palette before he'll sit down and try to, you know, work with a subject. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a lot of prep work on it. But again, it makes why you're sitting there actually working with the model or working, you know, on that scene, um, everything move much faster because you've got, you know, some colors already down there. You know, in the studio, you know, when she came back, you know, working from that reference that she had, that little plain air painting, uh, you know, she, she wanted to get something as close to it as she could. So, you know, she wanted, you know, she liked the relationships that she had in the plain air painting. And so she wanted to stay close to that. And so trying to go back in and match those colors and, and get those relationships set up, you know, was kind of important, uh, you know, in, in the process of doing that. So, yeah. Um, you know, and you could, you know, in theory, I mean, you could sit there and paint each area and, and mix the color or go back into it and just mix the color as you go along. Um, the, and it's not really an issue. It's just that you have to, you have to be more careful, you know, as you're mixing those different areas and really sensitive to what's happening in each of those shapes and, and things in, in the painting. So... You know, it's just a different way of working. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, you know, and I don't, you know, personally, when I'm going from, say, a study, and I'm doing the final painting, I don't really go back in and do a lot of, uh, you know, pre-mixing of color. And for me, the reason I don't do that is because, you know, I, I can pretty much so look at, you know, what I've done and I have a good idea of how I got there. So it's pretty easy for me to go back and remix something. But also, I'm not married, you know, to what's, you know, in that study. If, if while I'm working on it, you know, if I make a decision that, you know, I might need, you know, to push the color a little bit more or to, you know, uh, build the paint surface and make it more interesting uh, by, you know, creating broken paint passages or something like that. That's something that I can do, you know, while I'm actually doing the finish. You know, so it, for me, it just kind of keeps it open, you know, to actually making it kind of more fun to do the finished painting. You know, because I'm not a slave to staying stuck, you know, to that study. Uh, so, you know, everybody works mm -hmm. a little bit differently, you know. Um, yeah. So it's, it's a choice. Okay. Anybody else? Got any questions? Anything else about that video? Anybody find anything in there that helped them? Answered some questions, maybe? Nobody's talking to me. Yeah, it was, it was, you know, a good observation about which colors turn warm and cool and, mm -hmm. you know, how to use them. It, it was good. Yeah. Yeah, the thing I kind of enjoyed, and, and I hope that you guys got out of it, was, you know, for as much as you work with paint and mixing color and stuff like that, um, it's not an exact science. You know, it really isn't. And... You know, there's 20 different ways that she could have gotten to mixing almost those very same colors with what she had on her palette. And in, in many cases, she went to those strong kind of primary colors like the cad red and stuff like that. When she had a burnt sienna, which is a muted orange or red sitting right next to it that would have accomplished the same thing and much quicker by darkening the value and bringing down the intensity at the same time. I noticed that too. There yeah. was a there was a color she had on there. It was uh, uh, over to the right at the top, 
um, I don't know if it was that transparent stuff she was talking about. I'm yeah, sure no, she that didn't was, use it. Yeah, well, that was the medium. That's what that was. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and she started using it when she started applying paint. You know, the final. Oh. She used it as as a way of modifying the viscosity of the paint so that it was mm -hmm. more fluid. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. She didn't mix. She didn't pre mix it into the color. You know. Um, she did that as she, as she was working from area to area. Um, so it kind of just replaced like the, what they call stand oil or uh, painting mediums, you know, for her like terpenoid or, you know, a lot of artists will mix a little jar of what they call stand oil, um, which, you know, basically you, it's, can be made a lot of different ways, but the purpose of it is it thins down your paint but it doesn't break the, the viscosity of the paint down. So it still makes a good, strong paint film in the end. Um, you know, one of the issues with oil painting is that a lot of people will use solvent, you know, like terpenoid, uh, and they'll thin their paint with it. Well, that's okay, you know, on say the underpainting, or on the initial paint that you want to have it set up very quickly, evaporate and dry so that you can work back into it. Uh, but if you continue doing that with your final layers of paint, uh, you know, just like adding water to acrylic, uh, when you start adding solvent, you know, to your paint, it breaks down the actual adhesive quality to the paint that makes it stick together. And so if, if you, continue to do that, um, you know, you'll get, you know, kind of interesting, funky results sometimes as the paint dries. You'll get these like really shiny bright spots or you'll get, you know, these very flat, dull areas. <coughs> and it's because, again, you know, the paint's not necessarily, you know, really stuck together really well on there. So you want to be careful with that. Um, and, and usually, you know, I use solvent to basically clean my brushes with and, you know, for my initial blocking or toning a canvas. After that, you know, I pretty much so use the paint. And I really don't use any medium or very seldom will use a medium um, because of the way that I paint. I don't do a lot of glazes and stuff like that. You know, it's pretty much so direct, you know, color mixing, so it's a la prima. Uh, so I don't, I don't really need to do that. Now, in some cases when I, I do need a glaze, you know, then I'll use something like liquid or something like that as a painting medium. And that's, that's all that stuff was, you know, it's just another, you know, painting medium product, right? Anyhow, um, anybody else got anything to say about Kim Casavir before we go away? She emphasized the fact that you really need to know colors and that uh, paints have two to three names for each one. It's not just red, yellow, and blue. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and it changes from manufacturer to manufacturer, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and the thing is, you know, it's kind of funny, um, you know, if you buy a cobalt blue, you know, that seemed to be like one of her stronger, like blue that she had. And you look at like Windsor Newton, and then you look at Gamlin, and then you look at say, you know, um, Grumbacher or somebody like that. And you, you know, get three tubes of cobalt blue and you squeeze them out in the palette. None of them are gonna be exactly the same. You know, they're gonna be little shifts because everybody's got their little formulas for that. And, um, you know, so, you know, as, as you buy tubes of paint and kind of experiment and try new things, you know, you might find that you might like the cobalt blue, you know, in a gamelin, but they don't have a red or something that you like. So you may get a Grumbach or a Windsor Newton. And so, you know, you'll end up with, you know, a whole variety of different brands of paint uh, in a lot of cases you know, to work with. So that's, that's pretty, pretty standard for most people. Um, 
you know, you'll just find colors that you really like. And, and also it's the feel of the paint too, you know, the way it handles. You know, some manufacturers make paint that's very oily. Other manufacturers make it that are very dry. Uh, like for example, the uh, Winton and Windsor Newton paint that I use tend to be kind of dry, you know, uh, and a little bit stiff. Uh, some of the colors that I use in the Rembrandt are very oily, very liquidy, uh, you know, so you just get used to, you know, the differences, you know, in the feel of them. You know, in the end though, it's all oil paint, it all mixes together and, you know, it'll work, you know, just fine together. So you don't have to worry about that too much. Um, see how we do in time wise. Well, it's 11.33, right? And uh, I pulled some things. Um, I don't know whether I should show them today or not, okay? It's, uh, it really has more to do with drawing. And, um, you know, we've been talking about using pen and ink. And I wanted to just, I'll probably do this again, but I'm gonna share a couple of, uh, you know, pen and ink drawings with you guys. And uh, I'm going to start off. Uh, did, 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 yeah, okay. Uh, with Charles Dana Gibson. Okay. Now, anybody ever hear of the Gibson Girls? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, Gibson was uh, an illustrator, American illustrator. Uh, you know, he worked during a period of time. Uh, that they called the golden age of illustration, okay? And, uh, you know, these were pretty typical, you know, of his, you know, pen and ink drawings. And they used them in advertisements, public, you know, like publication books, you know, things like that. Uh, you know, beautifully done. And, you know, just very fluid, you know, really, really nice stuff. So, uh, and just, you know, I'll just look at a couple of these examples. And we'll go through this real quick. But, you know, very expressive. And notice, you know, the way that the pen line is used in the direction, you know, and how it, you know, he uses it to describe the shape of the form. Now, in Gibson's case, you know, he used a kind of a metal steel, you know, pen with, you know, different points and things on it. But he also used a brush, you know, like a small little detail brush in India, you know, to get these effects and the fluidity. You know, but really, really nice stuff. And if you, uh, let me blow this up a bit. Wow. You know, you can actually get a lot of uh, gray sort of tone, you know, in the pin line. Uh, and notice that the cross hatching, you know, when we talk about cross hatching, uh, very seldom, unless he wants to flatten the plane out, like right here, you know, this transition in the forehead, you know, very seldom does he go at like a 90 degree angle. You know, it's it's kind of you know just offsetting this part. Okay. Hmm. Um, you know, but nice stuff. You know, really really nice stuff. And very seldom, you know, do you see you know people, you know, these days, who take the time and patience, you know, to create drawings like that. But it, it's a very effective tool. It really is. Beautiful, beautiful way of working. So, you know, now, rather than using, like, you know, one of those steel pins, um, you know, you have the option of, you know, buying all kinds of these, you know, little fine line pins and things like that. And you can achieve, you know, a really similar effect with them. And, uh, you know, the nice thing is that, you're not always having to dip in, you know, and, and you know, pick up, you know, more ink. Uh, plus, they don't drip and run, 
the same way that those old steel pins did. Uh, so, uh, you know, they're, they're fairly easy to work with. Um, I'm gonna show you a little bit of my stuff that I did while I was a commercial illustrator way back in the day. And again, you know, this is all, you know, basically pen and ink stuff. Now, a lot of this stuff has color, uh, you know, laid in over the pen line. And in this case, and in most of these cases, it's, uh, it's either acrylic paint, but it's acrylic paint that's been thinned way down, you know, and used uh, a lot like watercolor. Uh, and the reason that I did that is that, uh, you know, I like the fact that the acrylic paint didn't move. <laughs> you know, it's like once I got it down there, you know, it would stay in place. But again, you know, it's, it's a lot of water, you know, and these were all done on like illustration boards or, you know, some kind of paper surface. They weren't on canvases. So, uh, you know, I, I didn't have to worry about the viscosity of the paint breaking down. Uh, long term and plus, you know, they're really they were made for short term use, you know, it's basically get the image down there, you know, and then get it, you know, photographed, color separated and, and use it. Okay. And then after that, I didn't really care what happened to the artwork itself. You know, I didn't, I wasn't worried about the archival, you know, qualities of it. Now, in this particular case, um, this was done for Callaway Gardens. And they were a client of mine for almost 15 years. Here's another piece for Callaway Gardens. And again, this started off as a pen and ink drawing. Okay. And Not then, a detail in there. Yeah. Yeah. And then it had color added, you know, to it. So. And in fact, uh, in this particular case, I think what happened is, you know, I did the sketch on a piece of illustration board, I did a pen and ink drawing on a piece of vellum, and then I had that, you know, photographed and uh, reproduced on a clear sheet of mylar, and the mylar laid over the top of the color. And that's how that was done. How was the color put on there? I, it was acrylic paint. So it was just painted on, it wasn't stroked on like a, with a pen, fine lines. Well, yeah, brushed, you know, little, mm -hmm. little brush, brush marks and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in different areas. And what did the mylon do? What, what, what is that? Well, the mylon is just a clear plastic, but that way the, uh, you know, the outline was mm -hmm. separate, you know, from the color. And so when they uh, reproduced it, they, you know, for a printer, you know, they could reproduce the line as a solid and then the color, they could break it down into what they call CMYK, you know, which is cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, which is a, you know, how they break down color for printing, you know, on a printing press. That's in the old day. Now they have inkjet printers. It does it all at once. So, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, technology has changed. It is. <laughs> um, you know, here's a just a little, um, you know, icon, you know, logo mark uh, for a client. This was Seaboard uh, Food, and they they had a whole line of packaged, uh, you know, like pre cooked meals and stuff like that. that these logos on. Uh, this was it's kind of a mix, you know. Some of it is editorial. Some of it is advertising. Uh, you know, as you can see, you know, this was an editorial piece. Uh, the baseball player was, you know, for a book, you know, this little farm scene back here was for a book that I did. And then these were some medical, uh, you know, kind of like little spot illustrations. Again, you know, selling this, uh, you know, pillow for, uh, you know, aligning your neck. <laughs> I remember that pillow. Yeah. Yeah, I think I've got one or two of those around. Yeah, there's another one of those Callaway, you know, pieces. Making me hungry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At lunch. <laughs> yeah. I like that palm tree. 
yeah yeah and that was fun to do you know it's and you know it was probably it was done at about 10 or 12 inches tall you know? okay. and uh you know when you begin to zoom in on it and this is one of the things i was talking about you know the other day um you know to begin to create value and changes in value and stuff like that you've got to kind of create you know or or have it your ready use different textures you know it's not just all lines mm -hmm. um but you know building up like in this case you know cross hatching and stuff uh you know to you know begin to build value you know because no matter what you put down you know it's going to be a black line but it's like when when you kind of look at it in total some areas can become great you know values um just by you know how much black versus how much white in the palm oh yeah mm -hmm. in your palm tree could you go back to that to the uh make it smaller mm -hmm. yeah i was looking at your first uh yeah yeah keep going Keep going. Yeah, now that first palm leaf there in the center, is that the one you started with? Or yeah, that one there? Uh probably, yeah. Okay. Yeah, more than likely. You know, what I what I really started with is I started off with a drawing, you know, mm -hmm. on a on a separate sheet of paper, you know, and did a value study. And then I put that on a light table and then I took a piece of vellum and then I did the drawing over that oh okay you know and and made my areas you know lighter and darker based on the values in the uh, actual drawing that i did mm -hmm. okay so all this is pen and ink uh-huh yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah wow how did you do the bark on the planet palm tree um again you know just cross hatching you know building you know like textures and values it seemed like there was the spots there were spots that looked like they were shaded or lighter mm -hmm. I was well, about that. again you know finer line you know less oh. less pen line you know more more white paper you know same thing's true here you know it's like how do you how do you get this darker you know and, and let it get lighter as it moves to the middle Wow, that's very interesting. Like you that. needed a steady hand and a lot of patience, right? Yeah, wow. <laughs> and, and and a patience. paycheck too. <laughs> patience. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, eventually, you know, a lot of this stuff evolved into, you know, digital work. And even though I was doing a lot of computer stuff, like this is all, you know, kind of computer based, um, you know, it started off as, you know, a black and white ink drawing you know these these little uh, icons right here like the glass and stuff like that you know those were all pen line drawings and then i scanned them and then worked with them in photoshop to begin to create you know the color and stuff like that in the background and so uh you know that gives you you know a little again uh, just another way of using you know an image and modifying it same thing is true here you know, again, I started with these little kids, you know, the, the drawing. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then I scanned the, you know, the ink drawing into, you know, into the computer in Photoshop. And then I added, you know, all the snowflakes and color background and did the metallic effects and stuff on the logo and the type. You know, combined it all together and as a final, like, Photoshop file. But mm -hmm. all of it started yeah. as original pen line drawing okay mm -hmm. wow you were good yeah. <laughs> yeah now charles i'm looking at these pictures on this one here mm -hmm. um the guy that's is he slipping on something is there a oh, banana yeah. there or something yeah yeah oh, okay yeah <laughs> yeah that's kind of the idea oh, okay is that what oh this is from a medical place right um that one, yeah, I think it was for Siemens. Yeah, that's, that's what I thought I saw, yeah. Medical. 
Yeah. If I remember. I like the one with the hands going around the earth. That's nice. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, you know, just different ideas, you know, mm -hmm. different, you know, different logos and marks and things that I made, you know, while I was working. So anyway. So yeah, that's kind of my experience, you know, with pen and ink. And it's, it's a great medium to work in, you know, and like I said, unlike the old days when you had to work with a, you know, India ink and a brush and, and a, a steel pen, you know, or different sizes of steel pens. Now you can, you know, buy little sets of, you know, like these markers that are all self-contained. They don't ever run out of ink. Well, until they're totally done. Uh, and you don't ever have to refill them. So you can just keep working, you know, and it's fine. You know, it works just fine. So, okay. Anyway, um, anybody got anything before we go? So with the pen and ink, as far as it's lasting and not dulling or uh, doing anything, it'll last a lot longer. Uh, does it need to be under a glass or, you know? Well, if it's paper. It? Yeah, if it's paper, it will always have to be under glass. Okay. Okay. The ink itself. The, the ink the picture itself, itself. Uh, depends. You know, if you buy um, permanent ink, hmm. it will last. Okay. Um, Some of it, though, is. It doesn't fade. Pardon? It doesn't fade, the ink. Uh, no, no it does not. Okay. But that's where you want to be very careful with buying those pens and make sure that it says that it's a permanent ink. Okay. And that it won't fade because some of them will. Okay. Now, the only way that you absolutely know that it will never fade is to actually use the real India ink. And that stuff is never going to go anywhere. Okay. It is permanent. I mean, we've got 3,000 year old documents and drawings with India ink on it that are still, you know, as good as the day that they were drawn. So. Anyway, mm -hmm. all right. Anyway, I got to run, but uh, we will be back here tomorrow at two o'clock, right? Yep, two o'clock. All right. Okay. See you all. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.